So, so uh, I want to welcome you all here this morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord and great to uh, be able to look at, look at his word today. If there are any here who may be here for the first time, can I see if there are any here in this class for the first time? All right, well, we're all old, old pros here, right? <laughs> So, so let's begin uh, with prayer. Father in heaven, as we uh, gather in this room this morning, those who've hopefully placed their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives, and I pray that there are any here this morning who maybe have not made that decision, that even today um, they would say yes to the wonderful invitation that Christ makes to come unto him. And I just pray that that would be so. And, uh, but, but while we're here right now, um, we anxiously wait for the day of the Lord. Uh, we know it could come at any moment. And all of us here today who watch the news or see what's going on, see our world spinning wildly and nearly out of control. But we know that it's not out of your control. And we trust you in that. And uh, I ask you, Lord, to help me and to help each person in this room to be a factor in in helping the people around us in our communities to be able to uh, hear the word of God and to become ready when the trumpet sounds and um, our pledge here I know as a group of those who love you um, are in the words of Jesus Christ who said, watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord will appear. And may we found, be found watching. So we love you, Lord, and uh, we love your word, and we ask you to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise you, Lord. Now there's a, there are some text on the table, some papers with uh, the text we're looking at, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapter 6 of Matthew, the last uh, 10 or 12 verses there, verses uh, 24 to 34. Now, if you would, open your Bible as well to that text, because we'll be reading a couple of texts that are not on that sheet. So have your Bible next to that text if you're using it. Um, last week, uh, Pastor Al said in his sermon, he said uh, the Sermon on the Mount was the greatest sermon ever preached. And it is a great sermon. Um, those of us who are teachers or pastors know that that's probably one uh, sermon that you will preach through at some point in your, um, in your ministry. And I know for me, I did it twice at least. And and it's something you can't just rush through because every verse is almost a lesson in itself. But we're going to try to, we're going to look this morning at the, toward the end of chapter 6. I've always loved these verses. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at those this morning as well. Now chapter 6, um, of course, is that chapter in the Sermon on the Mount that early in that chapter has what we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And uh, I would imagine that uh, many of you probably repeated that in your churches. Uh, the church I grew up in, you repeated every Sunday, you know. How many of you did, did repeat that? Yeah. And, uh, you, and, and it is beautiful, you know, it is. I, I see it myself as a model for our prayer life, not exactly, exactly one that's word, word by word meant to be done over and over and over, but it, 
if you do, it helps. You know, it's, it's a great prayer. And uh, so when you drop down to verse 19, if you have your Bibles open to chapter 6, here's what it says in verse 19. Uh, Don't store up treasures on earth, here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Um, and treasures on earth disappear pretty fast. You know, though most of the folks in this room, you've lived a long time, and you've seen some things happen in your life. You, you realize the truth of that. Even in... Um, the Old Testament, Haggai, you remember these verses, but Haggai, when they went back to build the temple and all this and that, he says in the first chapter of Haggai, he says, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says, look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You, you eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though they were putting them in pockets filled with holes. And I think how many of us, so it was years, remember, especially young married, you know, when you get your paycheck and it's all gone by the time the Monday comes or whatever, you know. My, my wife and I have been trying to accumulate enough money to buy our house because we've been renting our house. And, uh, you know, now that, I'm, now that I'm fairly young, I feel we could still do that, you know. I think I figured I'd be 113 or 12 when it's paid off or something like that. But in, anyway, we've had to borrow most of the money for, for the down payment. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, a scammer fooled me, got a hold of me, and took $2,000 out of my account. And that was a week ago. That was a week ago, Saturday night. Uh, well, Thursday before that, my bank had called me and said, uh, someone's got a hold of your number, and they're charging all kinds of stuff. You know, they got a fraud department. And they, uh, of course, they put that money back. It was like $1,037 worth of charges, This whoever did it. But this second one happened on Saturday night. And I got the call, and I thought, and they said, this is Chase Bank, you know, calling. I said, oh, good, I hope we're getting this straightened out, you know. And they said, well, someone has tried to spend $2,000 in Houston, Texas, out of your account. And then they went through this process, and I foolishly, thought they were putting the money back in my account and it was going to some stranger and the bank won't pay for it. But what I'm saying here is uh, um, you put your treasures in heaven, that's really the important thing. I mean, that's what life is about. Money can disappear quickly. So Jesus says, don't store it up down here. Store your treasures up in heaven. And we store our treasures up in heaven by our service to uh, Christ, by our service to God right now, and by giving of our time, our talents, and our treasure to Him. And uh, this is how we store, that's how you put your treasures ahead to Him. Um, as someone at the reading table there would read Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. Work willingly at what you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people, and the Lord will give you an inheritance. You know, he's, He will give you what, you, what uh, He appreciates about what you're doing and, um, and then Jesus goes on to say and you're back in your text there you can use the paper now if you want to use it um, in verse 24 right at the beginning of that uh, he says no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other you'll be devoted to one and despise the other you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. 
That's from the New Living Translation. Um, in other words, don't let money uh, and riches become your master. Rather, commit yourself to Christ as his servant. And by the way, that word servant is what Paul used, that word. It literally means slave. And serve him for the rest of your lives. That's what that's talking about. And that is where pure joy is found. Pure joy is found in living righteously as Christ teaches us to live. That's where pure joy is found. And we'll see a little more about that later on. Uh, so when you begin the very next verse, verse 25 in that text, here's how it begins. That is why. You see that? That is why. Some of your texts will say, therefore. Whenever you see a therefore, you look back to the previous verse or a few verses and see why they're saying this. He said, that's why. Um, uh, in other words, because you cannot serve two masters both God and money, I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Now, what this is talking about is value and precedent. What comes first? What's the most important thing? Uh, what is the most valuable thing? If you were to take all of your clothing... Okay, you go into your closets at home, and all your clothing, you put them in a big pile in the middle of the room. And some of us have a big pile there, you know. And then you would stand next to that pile. You can put your clothes there too if you want, but I don't want to think about that picture. But uh, um, you're standing here, and your clothes are, are right there. Then... Um, What's the most valuable? Isn't it life? Isn't it the living, breathing person whom God created to serve Him? Much more value. Oh, you say, I pay a lot for my clothes, you know. I pay uh, big money. I just read when I was going through studying this that the, the government puts a value on human life, you know. The government says we're worth $10 million per person. And um, I don't know how they arrive at that. But God sees the importance is, is us, is our person, is our life. It's not the clothes. And, but what so many do, and even in the Christian community, is we spend so much of our time and worry about how we look and what we need and how to keep up to date and all these kinds of things. He said, no, it's life is more important than clothes. Also, um, do it with your food. I know it's, a, it's going to be a mess, but take all the food out of your cupboards and put it in a pile there, all the food you got, and stand next to it. I know you're spending a lot with inflation and everything, but what's, what's more valuable? It's you. It's your life. And, um, and so... We, we, we want to get this message in our minds a little bit. You can read over that verse quickly and not catch that message. It is that your life is much more important than the things you own. It's a really good lesson. Um, and he's talking about value. Um, you might say, well, this is obvious, Ron, <laughs> what you're saying, uh, what Jesus is saying, but in this world, and you may be able to think about this right now, in this world, the value of human life has really plummeted. I see in my lifetime, and, and growing up and being raised in the church and as a Christian, but seeing a world that uh, life is losing its value in the minds of so many people. Yes. And, um, um, you know, we need food and drink to live. I'm not saying you know, get rid of all of it. But I'm saying that uh, uh, life is more than food and drink and clothing. In the eyes of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, we place value on things far above God's highest creation, which is you. You're God's highest creation. 
And um, so let's look at what he says about this whole idea of worrying about this stuff. That's, this is a great text. Verse 26. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? There again is that idea of value. Some of you here probably are bird watchers. How many are bird watchers? Wow. So you have like a window with a, a bird feeder outside there, and then you can replenish it. Fight off the squirrels, yeah. <laughs> My dad and mom had, a, had it out there, and they had the squirrel issue. And he would put grease on the pole. <laughs> and and he'd, he'd, you watch the squirrels try to get up there. Yeah. But they are amazing acrobats. They can get it. They can really get in there. Um, but they're amazing creatures, the birds. They're amazing. Um, I read that, for instance, a sparrow. Now, there are different kinds of sparrows. But a sparrow that we know of, weighs about one and a half to two and a half ounces. That's all they weigh. You know, you'd think they'd weigh a little more than that, you know. Maybe a quarter pound, half a pound, but they, that's because they fly, you know. They had God made of light so they could flit around. And, but, but the sparrow eats one-third of its body weight every day and drinks one-third of its body weight in water every day. There you are. And so they're busy. They're out there. And um, imagine if we did that, right? Let's see. Uh, I was going to see. I was going to ask Sue Odell how much she weighed, but she wouldn't cooperate with me on that. So, but, uh, you know, I'm about 240 pounds. Okay. So let's say a third of that is what? How much? Oh my gosh, 80, okay, so 80 pounds of food, and then 80, a third of water, you know, I mean, just imagine that, the, the difference there, right there, but God provides for the birds, he provides bugs, seeds, worms, it's all out there, but the bird goes out and gets it, right, and God provides for us. He provides for us, but we don't just sit down and say, Lord, just pour it all down right in front of me. We go out and we do it, but he provides it. That's why we say grace before we eat. That's why we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this meal. And, uh, you know, there are people all around our world right now, and you may know some, in, other, in third world countries especially, who spend a big part of their day just gathering food for that day, so they can eat, and, um, and so forth. And we, we are blessed here, even though we see inflation and everything, we're, we're still the richest around the world. We still have, as you can tell, more <laughs> eating more than we should, you know. And so, um, uh, look at the birds. They, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And you are worth much more, aren't you much more valuable to him than them? Let me ask you. Do you see yourself as valuable? Do you? Do you see yourself as a valuable person in God's creation? Do you? This is an issue many people around the world see themselves as um, always uh, depreciating their, themselves and not realizing that we are created by God and made in his image. I, I took this, this is uh, the value of human life. I, I wanted to know what the Bible says about, and there are a hundred verses here. Someone, you can take this if you want. I just type printed it out and on both sides the verses and if more than one wants it you could make copies I'm sure that um, Larry would agree that you could just make those copies for you but um, we are made in God's image 
you know, we're we are uh, we are important to Him, very important to God. Uh, aren't you more valuable to Him than they are? Jesus says, and you are valuable to God. Um, one of the reasons is, yes, sir. We are always more valuable than what we think we are. Always. I would say so. Yes. Yes. Matthew twenty twenty eight. Do you have it under there? Use the mic when you read it. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He gave his life as a ransom for us because we are valuable to God, valuable to him. And by the way, birds are not chopped liver either. Maybe they may not be as valuable as we are, but they are really technologically intricate little critters. When... Um, Karen and I lived up in Palos Heights, and we had this nice patio in the back, and we were sitting out in the patio, and, and birds, this bird would build its nest up in, above our back door every year, and it'd do two families of birds. And, and you sit there, and it's just flip, 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 and they're bringing stuff, and busy, and all this and that. So Karen and I, we asked ourselves, it just, it just came to us, do birds ever sleep? Do they ever sleep? And when do they sleep? And of course, we, have, we had the internet, so we have all the wisdom of the world at our fingertips. So we got on the internet, and we discovered that birds have what is called unihemispheric slow-wave sleep. Birds also sleep with one half of their brain awake. It's called unihemispheric slow-wave sleep and keeps birds alert to potential predators while still catching some Zs. Other animals sleep this way, but only birds have the ability to control it. A sleeping bird can adjust how much of its brain is asleep by how wide it opens or closes its eye. Isn't that something? I mean, isn't God great? I mean, our, our Creator, our Creator... It's great. He did that. So the big idea is don't worry. Don't worry. So he's saying God takes care of the birds and he will provide food for you and me as well. Amen? He does. Um, do you have Psalm thirty-seven twenty-five there, brother? Once I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Yes, the psalmist said that. Um, you know, his whole life, the godly people, God seemed always to provide in some way. Maybe not rich, you know, or that kind of thing, but enough to, to live. Um, and also there's a verse there in the Lord's Prayer. Do you have it there? Just one phrase. Um, Matthew 6, 11. Give us today the food that we need. Yeah. Give us this day our daily bread, we pray in the Lord's Prayer. And um, so look at verse 27 in your text there. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Do you agree that it's not? it can't? Um, what it could do, constant worry could very possibly cause you to die younger than you might otherwise die because there is good evidence that worry can bring about heart disease and things like that that can come because of your body always being, not being, you know, restful and uh, it, it's always, always worrying about stuff. All the time, and I'm talking to people right here who that, there's someone in this room, no doubt, who says, "Amen." That's where I am right now. I just I, I worry all the time, but it's not for the Christian to be worrying all the time. Okay, look at verse 28. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. 
They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. You know, there's a, there's a portion in the Bible, and I, can't, I didn't look up the text, but it's in the Kings or back in that area where, remember the Queen of Sheba came and visited uh, King um, Solomon. And she was amazed. She explained, she is just, just the way your servants are dressed and the way everything, she just couldn't get over it. And she was the queen, you know. But she couldn't get over the rich, and that was a rich society. It was 40 years. They said, they said silver was just like rocks on the street, you know. It, it was a tremendous time to live. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as a wildflower. That's what he's talking about, the wildflower. Here, this lily. Verse 30. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Amen. There it is. He will certainly care for you. He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? He will certainly care for you. Can you all say that with me? He will certainly care for you. Amen. Why do you have so little faith, Jesus says to them? Because they're worried that they're not, the people he's speaking to, that they're not going to have enough. And um, you may say, well, you don't know the troubles that I face every day. And that's true, I don't. Um, I know there may be some here right now who have trouble, really some issues and things that just keep them up at night. And what's going to happen? And worry, worrying about all these things. Trouble. And uh, notice, if you drop down the bottom of your page there of the text, the very last phrase in verse 34 Look what it says. Today's trouble is enough for today. Yes. Notice that Jesus Christ himself introduces the word trouble in the text. Well, wait a minute. I, I, I thought Jesus was prosperity. I thought that, you know, everything that he says about us should make us rich and everything, yes, you know. But he says, there's trouble. There'll be trouble tomorrow. You have trouble today. You, he's not saying that trouble goes away. You know, that's not what he's talking about here. Um, he introduces the word trouble there. And that word trouble is an interesting word. This, this is an interesting word. Um, the, the Thayer's Greek lexicon, uh, it's the word kakteia. It's K-A-K-I-A. And that's the transliterated word between the Greek and the English. And here's what it says about that word trouble. It says it denotes rather the vicious disposition. It denotes rather the vicious disposition, the active exercise of the same. In other words, the active exercise of a vicious disposition. Um... Faith in Almighty God produces a more peaceful and calm disposition uh, because you're not depending solely on your own resources but upon God's resources to carry you through the day. And when we don't depend on God, when we carry it in ourselves and we said, I'm just going to worry because I have to worry, and over the trouble that I'm having today, it can cause a vicious disposition. Even in Christians. This is not how it should be. No, there should be peace. And uh, the pastor said last week in his sermon, blessed are the peacemakers. Amen. Peace. So, um, so verse 31 says, so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? 
These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Do you think He does? He knows where you're at. He knows what's happening in your life. He knows all your needs. Your heavenly Father knows all your needs. And so He's not surprised by whatever comes up in your life that's, that's a trouble or difficulty. So instead of going around all day with a vicious disposition, you and I must ex expend our energy seeking the kingdom of God above all else and just living righteously. I memorized a verse a long time ago and, and uh, it, was, it was on the John's epistles, you know, the first epistle, the second chapter, the six, sixth verse, and I just have it loosely. But it says, those who, abide, those who say they abide in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. Or must walk as He Himself walks. It would say in some of your versions. In other, yes. In other words, um, uh, if we say we are Christians, is what He's saying. The Christian says, I, I abide in Christ. Then we should live our lives. And that's what walking is. You know, it's just... Everything you do, uh, your life, your job, your friends, uh, everything you do, you do with the attitude of Christ. And it makes life, it makes life beautiful. It actually does. It, it causes, you, you don't have a vicious disposition when you walk as Jesus walked, do you? And that's what, I think that's a lesson that we should get out of this here. That verse, by the way, is 1 John 2.6, if you want to look it up. Let's walk as Jesus walked. Um, verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And that means righteously means rightly. It just means living like Jesus lived when he's on this earth, right? Doing the right things. You know, being right, not doing the wrong things. That's what it means. And he will give you everything you need. What a promise. Great promise. What a promise. Yeah, absolutely. You believe that, do you? you can't that yeah. So don't worry about tomorrow, verse 34. For tomorrow will bring its own worries Today's trouble is enough for today. Now let's go back to verse 28 for a minute. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. I want to share an experience about this if you would allow me. In verse 29, Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow. It said that when they dried up, they would use those as uh, to put in their stoves when they start a fire in their stoves to start the fire. He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that they are here today, and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? I want to tell you about uh, an experience I had. I, uh, I've usually in my lifetime, throughout my life, uh, been able to handle stressful situations pretty well because I operated my own business, I was a pastor and all this and that. You, you have a lot of things come to you at once, you know, and all this and that that can get you down. And sometimes it does, you know. But um, there's, there's a time back in the early 90s uh, when my daughter was living in California and was in danger of losing her son, our grandson, to the state. And I'd gone out there, and uh, I was there for quite a, about three weeks, and I was taking care of my grandson. He was about a year old and, and just, uh, just loved him to death. And... So I was going to court, 
and trying to see if we could get possession of him because the father was not involved at all. And you know, it just blows my mind that um, the court did all it could to get that little boy and put him in the system somewhere where he would go into a place where we'd never see him again and he would be living with, you know, other families and things yeah. like that. And, uh, boy, I tell you, I was not going to let that happen. And, legally or not, I was not going to let that happen because I loved that little boy. And I was desperate, getting desperate in my mind because we go in there and it's just like we weren't there. My wife and I were decent people. We would take him and love him, you know. And uh, my daughter was with me too as well. And uh, it was just like they were taking him. They were trying to take him out of our hands. And um, so um, my daughter and I went out for a break. At the break in the court, we went outside. It's California, you know, nice weather out there. And get some fresh air, and two men walked up to us and said my daughter's name and produced handcuffs and uh, took hold of her arm. And I immediately I stepped in between the two men and put my hand up on the guy's chest because I said, what, what's happening here, you know? And the guy says, I wouldn't do that. And he pulled his coat back, and he had a gun, and he flipped a badge. He, they were bounty hunters, bounty hunters. And what they do, they go out and get people who hadn't paid their um, s tickets for driving. You know, they accumulate a whole bunch. and they, So these bounty hunters would come and get them. Well, that's what happened to my daughter. I didn't know that, but she had a bunch of tickets that she had not paid. And, um, and so the thought came to my mind, you know, if I make a scene here, I will get arrested, and then my grandson... He's in there in that kid's playroom in the courthouse, and who knows if they're trying to get him in there. And I just had all these pressures on me. And when uh, my, water, my daughter walked away between two strange men in handcuffs, my heart crumbled in me. It crumbled. And so I just... Um, and by the way, let me just say this about this situation. My mother once told us boys, I have four brothers, when we were young teenagers, that beauty can be a curse. Uh, I'm not certain how the subject came up when we were talking to my mother, but my mother herself was a beautiful woman, had experienced things in her life that perhaps caused her to say, well, it can be a curse in your life. And the reason I say that is because my daughters were all be very beautiful young ladies. And... I think that this particular daughter about whom I'm speaking this morning got into a lot of trouble because she was taken advantage of by men at a young age because she was one of these and is still today one of these just non-judgmental people who just sees everybody at face value and is, would be a wonderful friend to have, you know. To know her is to love her. And, you know, fortunately, she got through that time in her life and became a wonderfully uh, godly woman, a hard worker and, and everything, and loves the Lord with all her heart. And to know her is to love her. So when these two strange men walked away with my daughter in handcuffs that day, um, I was really in a bad way. I think I had tears in my eyes, and, I, and it wasn't just sadness. I think it was anger, too. I think it was a mixture of all of that. And I was inwardly disintegrating emotionally. And I, I remember coming, walking up to the parking lot. I don't know why I went up there, but I walked up to this curbing there. I had this curbing around the parking lot. And I stopped there. And uh, I, as I looked down there, among the dirt and the gravel and the litter, was one beautiful yellow flower. <laughs> It was right there. I wrote about it once. I couldn't find the article because back then we wrote longhand. I didn't have a computer. And I couldn't find the article. But I wrote about that experience. But I looked down and there was this beautiful 
yellow flower. The only one. And it, it is, there's scraps and litter and gravel and paper and dirt, you know, and everything there, but it was perfect. It was beautiful. And uh, Tony Hoagland is a writer, and he wrote uh, a poem about, don't call it Don't Tell the Flowers. And I borrowed the theme, but I didn't borrow his words, my thoughts. And I said, don't tell the flower. She thinks the sun loves her. She's looking up, you know, (laughs) at the sun. Don't tell her that she's living in dirt with trash all around that might spoil her mood. Look at her. (laughs) And I remember... This is for real. I, I remember I probably would have been locked up if I would have, if some psychological people would have got to hold me there. But I, I looked at the flower and I literally said, I wish I, I, wish I was you. You know, I said, I wish we could just change places because it's so beautiful. There it is, just waving at everybody, you know. Enjoying what it was placed there to enjoy. Not any problems at all or anything like that. Look at her. Don't tell her that she's really not supposed to be happy. You know? Look at her. She's waving happily in the breeze at everyone with a smile on her face. I wish I could tell you the beauty of that flower. I don't know what kind it was. Don't tell her about the danger that's all around her. Uh, 5,000 pairs of shoes going back and forth where she is, down there in the dirt. And uh, lawnmowers with steel blades, you know. And maybe a, even a cow straggling over there with two stomachs that would like to eat them too, you know. Danger. Danger. And uh, don't tell her that she might not then be happy anymore if you told her that stuff. I must look (laughs) at that flower and I must learn an important lesson from that flower today, that gorgeous, happy little flower that Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as you are. And if God cares so wonderfully for you who are here today and gone tomorrow, He will certainly care for me. And He'll care for you. Why do you have so little faith? That's Jesus' words to this. Rather, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously. He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen? Amen. I think that's where I'm going to stop. Right there. I want to thank you for your attention and thank you for uh, becoming a part of the sir. I can't help but think when we talk about possessions and money and such as that, notice in heaven your clothes have no pocket. Does that tell you something? It tells me something. So you you got in on some stuff I, I wasn't aware of there. <laughs> I need to talk to you. So let's... Uh, Let's have a prayer, and then we'll go on and to the service. Father, I just thank you today for giving us, uh, well, first of all, for just creating beautiful things, and then uh, for using something like that to give a lesson to us about worry and care and danger. God, may we trust you more today. I know I don't want to be simplistic about the folks who are here today. I don't know what's going on in everyone's lives. But I do know and believe 
that what we read in these verses today is the truth, the truth from God. And that, that, that we could take it to heart today and live a life of trusting in you rather than in our own selves. Please help us in this regard as we go from here. In Jesus' name, amen.